Hello everyone, this is Mars Man here, and this is Mars Man Gaming. Today, I'm going to review Halo Infinite, and I'm sure you may be wondering, Mars Man, why the hell are you waiting so damn long to review Halo Infinite? It's been a damn month already. Well, not on this viewer, most game reviewers are too emotional when games first release, whether it's too positive or too negative. So I feel the best type of reviews are when you wait some time to let the game soak in and allow the emotions to settle before you make a final verdict. Listen to some different perspectives before you throw your reputation behind a bad review. For example, when Halo 5 first came out, I remember the hype was out of this world. The studio has brought Halo's mechanic kicking and screaming into the modern era while providing the most bombastic co-op driven campaign in Halo history. What? Bombastic Halo experience? I think is the best time to have an honest review of Halo Infinite. Big note to everybody, this is my opinion. This is based off the many years of gaming experience and the fact that I played Halo since I was the age of seven. I feel like I kind of know what I'm talking about here. In this video, I'm going to break down Halo Infinite both in the multiplayer aspect and the campaign in great detail, while also giving my opinion on where the game sticks to landing and where it also falls on its face. Does Halo Infinite's campaign recapture the magic that was set during the Bungie era, or is this game just overhyped? This is Marsman's review of Halo Infinite. So let's start off with the multiplayer. I'm going to break down the multiplayer into several parts. Firstly, we're going to talk about gameplay, we're going to discuss the maps and modes, we'll go into the progression and customization, also addressing the microtransactions. We'll discuss, lastly, the guns, vehicles, and equipment. So let's get started with the gameplay. I felt the gameplay was very smooth. I mean, very reminiscent of a Halo 3 and a version of Halo Reach that feels like this is returning to the classic Halo. Halo Infinite basically throws away all the armor abilities like Ground Pound and Spartan Charge and return to the simplicity of the Golden Triangle, which made Halo fans fall in love with the series in the first place. The Golden Triangle is key. Guns, grenades, and melee. I mean, it just makes life so simple. Some abilities do return to Halo Infinite, like for example, Clamber and Sprint, and I'm honestly happy about it. Because you can't have a game about a super soldier and basically only run a quickened version of a jog. 3 for 3 solved the sprinting debate once and for all. And forever, thank the praises of the gods, I'd never have to hear another rant video about why sprinting basically ruins Halo. Because this is the perfect version of sprint that I think everybody is happy with. So gameplay is probably the best part of this multiplayer. I mean, it's smooth, it's quick, it's easy to pick up, and it fits just right all the right angles. There are some hit registration issues that I think 3 for 3 needs to fix pretty quickly because there have been times where I've landed a punch, I've heard the punch, and it didn't register, or some bullets are going around corners. But that's just a small thing that easily can be fixed in day one patches. So, so far, so good. Now let's go into the maps. I mean, when you look at the total on maps here, we have 10 total, seven arena, that's Aquarius, Bazaar, Behemoth, Launch Site, Live Fire, Recharge, and Streets, and three BTB maps, Deadlock, Fragmentation, and High Power. To start, I overall like the maps of Halo Infinite. I never actually have any ill feelings toward any of them. The biggest issue I have is that there's only 10 of them. Well, Marsman, there's only 11 in Halo 3 and 12 in Halo 2. You're not wrong, Anonymous viewer, but those games were made more than 14 years ago. The technology of today is way more advanced compared to what we're discussing in Halo 3 and Halo 2. I mean, those systems back then couldn't even handle a farming simulator that was created this past year. The issue with having fewer maps is that you're getting less variety. There's a good chance you can play the same map several times in a row, and that could just be boring. I mean, there have been times where I played High Power three times in three separate, separate game modes. As much as I like High Power, you know, Strongholds, Flag, and Slayer three times in the same place can get old pretty quick. Don't get me wrong, I love the maps. I mean, Bazaar is one of my favorites, and like I mentioned, High Power is really great because the fact is each area has its own character. I mean, they have its own terrains, its own backstory. Whether you're playing big team CTF on a Halo ring in Fragmentation, or you're playing Slayer in the streets of New Mombasa, you're going to get a variety of different backgrounds and lore behind them, which makes it feel just so much more satisfying to play on these. Like I said, the maps are really great. Downside is there's not, not a lot of them. Nextly, let's talk about the playlist and the modes here. 
Every multiplayer game is dependent on the modes and playlist that comes along with it. Just like the maps issue, Halo Infinite launched with a lackluster number of playlists. On day one, Halo multiplayer started with Quick Play, BTB, Bot Slayer, and Ranked Arena. Also included in the launch was going to be the training mode and the weapons, weapons range, which is I think is pretty cool. As a longtime Halo fan, I was a little nervous at seeing this, because the fact is, I didn't see Team Slayer on that list. Now granted, I have to give them credit, they did listen to player feedback, and they started adding more playlists as soon as possible. They did add Team Slayer, Free For All, Team Tactical, and Team Fiesta. The biggest issue currently with the playlist count is that most Halo fans are worried that you only have one ranked playlist. You're going to be competing against the most sweatiest of people in the entire Halo community in one way. This causes the freedom of choice to completely disappear. You need to have both ranked and social playlist included in Halo. Because the fact is, the best part about Halo all these years was that you had the ability to choose what you want to play. We need to have Infection. We need to have King of the Hill. We need to have Assault. We need to have that feeling of the Halo circle of life returning to us. This is very similar to what happened with Halo 5. Halo 5 didn't have Big Team Battle at launch. But one thing they did have was Warzone, the 12v12 game mode, which did bother a lot of people because it did include that rec system, which not a lot of people enjoyed. But the point is, it had a big team playlist that was effective at really giving you that feeling of large-scale warfare in Halo. Right now, Big Team Battle is broken. For some reason, the server issues are struggling, and honestly, I'm a little nervous about it. I haven't been able to play an effective Big Team Battle match in literally weeks. Big Team Battle is one of my favorite game modes, and I, honestly, if you have a player count of more than four in your party, you're not going to be able to play together. And that's such, something that is so drastically missing in Halo that you really need to fix this ASAP. Yeah, the weapons range and training modes are cool, but BTB literally being unplayable in the first month is such a disappointment. Now, let's discuss the biggest and most debated topic in Halo community right now, and that's the progression system. For those of you that are new to the series or just returning players that want to go down memory lane, Halo games usually saw progression the same way. Usually when you play multiplayer matches, you get XP after every single game, and as time progresses, you end up ranking up and you get some cool banner or emblem that goes to your service record. Generally, when you rank up, you end up getting to equip the new armors for your Spartan as time progresses. As newer Halo games launched, like Halo Reach, the implementation of the credit system started to be pretty standard, where after every game, not only did you unlock XP, but you also unlock credits. These credits would be used to purchase new armors to be equipped to your Spartan. Now, enter Halo Infinite. At launch, no XP per match, no rank level ups, no winnable credits at, to purchase armors. XP was granted solely through completing challenges, and these challenges weren't easy. I mean, I'm an experienced gamer, and I couldn't sometimes complete all the weekly challenges. And the problem was is that you would only progress through this battle pass system, which was extremely difficult to go through. Because of the fact that you would barely get any XP and battle pass progression only worked through challenges. You didn't get any sort of level ups by just playing the game. Most armors, unfortunately, through Halo Infinite are not through the battle pass, but through a microtransaction paywall where you have to use real money to purchase armors to equip to your Spartan. The progression system has been updated since day one, and I gotta give credit that they are fixing some of the problems that they were the ones that started. So XP is now easier to obtain where they give you a kind of layered system for just playing games. You start off with a bigger number like 300 and you progressively get smaller as you play more games throughout the day. And the microtransaction issue is still a problem, but it is getting adjusted in some ways where you get these mini events and you get free armors that will accompany you as you progress through that event by completing challenges. But these mini events only go a certain extent. They still aren't really giving you a lot of armors for all the work that you're going through. I honestly feel like the issues with microtransactions can be fixed by doing one thing, adding credits that you can earn for completing challenges. To be honest, I was thinking about this for a while now, since the actual release of the game. Following in a Halo Reach style of progression where you level up through the battle pass and you basically earn credits by completing challenges will give people an incentive to purchase 
these things through the bundles that you have on your microtransactions. Let's look now at the customization. And I am such a big fan of being able to customize my Spartan in every way, shape, or form. And currently, I feel like there should be more done in this system. I mean, honestly, when you look at the way the color schemes are organized, they're doing this through armor coatings, which are basically a copy of what Destiny currently does with their system. And I honestly am not the biggest fan of it. I mean, I kind of like some of the different designs that they have, but there's so much more that you can do with it. I honestly would rather be able to pick the colors of my Spartan rather than really hoping that a armor coating will give me the color I like. But the problem is that they don't really give you a lot of choice here. There's a lot of cool emblems in this game. And honestly, I, I did purchase some emblems. I did have the, the Master Chief emblem. I did buy the Arbiter emblem. I mean, these are cool. The problem is I can't really pick the colors that go into that emblem. And honestly, if you did do that, I would be okay with the system. Armor cores are a really cool idea. I really like the fact that each armor core looks different in its own way. But one thing I really don't like about it is that you can't use armors that you unlock through the battle pass or you purchase to different armor cores. And the biggest problem with this system is that it's limiting the amount of creativity that your Halo universe has. And I feel like that's something you need to fix right away, 3 for 3. Let's now go into the guns, vehicles, and equipment. And we'll start off with the guns and equipment first, just because I feel like they kind of go in a similar category. There are 21 guns in Halo Infinite so far, and the cool thing is that they seem like they ha are adding more based on the local files that are actually in the offline system. I think the guns in this game are pretty cool. The fact that they have their own certain roles for certain situations is, is a really cool touch about this game. Now, the only downside is, is that you can never use the pulse rifle ever. I mean, I really wish they just brought back the plasma rifle and just called it a day. The pulse rifle is literally one of those guns that you see it on the ground and you just walk right past it. But the fact that they have these different types of ammos like the kinetic, the hard light, plasma, and shock ammo is so interesting. It was kind of a system that they used back in Halo 5 where in a certain situation, like if you were to fight a guy with an overshield, you would use a plasma-based gun because it would erase your shield pretty quickly. And I really like that concept where it's more strategic. It's more about finding the best gun for the situation, not just picking up any gun and just hopefully you win. Now, when you look at specific guns... There are like some S-level guns in this game. I mean, when you look at the battle rifle, you look at the assault rifle, the energy sword, and the rocket launcher, I mean, they are just golden guns to me. The battle rifle feels so good in this game. I remember that when I first shot it, I was like, this is smooth. This is nice. The assault rifle, I think, is the best version of this game. I think this is literally the best assault rifle in the history of Halo. It, uh, it works best in short to medium range. It does exactly what you want it to do, and if you shoot it the right way, you can clean everything with it. The energy sword and the rocket launcher are out of this world. And if you find a grapple shot and have those guns, you can be unstoppable. Obviously, there are some guns that need to be fixed. I mean, when you look at the Ravenger and the pulse rifle, they are literally unusable. I mean, the Ravenger in the beta was awesome. I used to use it all the time. And then they like saw that and said, oh, we need to make this gun horrible. And they did. And they really need to fix it. Because like I said before, you see these guns on racks or you see it on the floor and you literally are walking right past that thing. I'm looking forward to seeing what they do fix and what they do adjust, but please, oh please, 3 for 3, do not change the assault rifle. Do not change the battle rifle. They are literally perfect the way they are, and honestly, I'd be upset if they did adjust them. Now, when it comes to the equipment, I think that this is a great feature they brought back. I think Halo 3, when they first implemented these in Halo 3, I was really excited because if you were good at picking up an equipment and using it in a certain situation, you were a top tier Halo player. Now, my favorite is going to be the grapple shot and the repulsor. And surprisingly, and I'll, I'll admit this right now, when the grapple shot was first proposed and said, hey, this is going to be a key equipment in this game, I was nervous. But when I play Halo Infinite with the grapple shot, it's my absolute favorite equipment, and honestly, I'm looking for it every single game. The repulsor is so satisfying to use because when you get to kind of repulse someone off the cliff or just so happen when you can repulse a bullet like a rocket launcher back at an enemy, it's so satisfying to see that kill cam. But there are some equipment items that definitely need an upgrade. I mean, you look at the drop shield and the threat sensor. I mean, they're literally my last options. I mean, they just need to be boosted in some way to at least give them a more of an advantage to have. Now let's transition into the vehicles. And I honestly, when I look at vehicles, there are 11 of them, which generally is not too bad. Obviously, you can add more, and I, I already know they will at some point. 
The biggest issue I have about vehicles is that the health is just so damn low. I mean, you pick up a vehicle and then it will die after a couple shots or be weakened for a couple shots. Honestly, when you look at the Banshee, the Banshee used to be one of the best vehicles in any Halo game. You pick it up in Halo Infinite, you will die in the first minute of you holding that thing. The Banish designs are really cool. I mean, the Covenant was more sleek, more clean. The blue color was bright. Then you look at the, the Banished. They have this reddish color, more bru brutal looking, more in your face looking. And it's a nice little touch that not a lot of people notice. But the sound design that 343 has is phenomenal. These things have a punch to them. When you turn on the Warthog, you can feel the engine. And I really like that idea. It shows you how much homework they did here. All right, now let's go into the campaign. I'm going to break down the campaign into four sections. We're going to talk about the story, the characters, the bosses, the map, environment, and lastly, the music. But quick note, we're going to talk about spoilers. So you might want to skip this section if you haven't played the story and you don't want it to be ruined. So please do that now. So let's jump right into the story here. The Halo story under 3 for 3 has been on and off since they took over the series. Halo 4 had a good start to the trilogy and obviously opened up a lot of questions that had to be answered and kind of got you excited for Halo 5. Then you look at Halo 5 and went into the complete opposite direction and actually made more questions for you to be answered and left you actually confused on what the hell was going on. Especially when you look at this insane marketing campaign where they had basically Lock and Chief going mano a mano and whoever can get the advantage over the other were basically going to be seen as the, the hero of the story. And basically Lock was going to be hunting Chief down. I mean, whoa, that sounded badass. Then you played it, you're just like, is, is this the right game? So all eyes are on Halo Infinite. When the game finally released, everyone was wondering, what's the story going to be about? And do they quell the fears that most Halo fans had after playing Halo 5? Halo Infinite starts with a feeling that we've had before in the series. Humans are under attack from an alien force that are way stronger than they are, in this case the Banished, and it's up to Master Chief and his small band of friends to basically retake the ring and fight against all odds. Hmm. Where have we seen this one before? All jokes aside, Halo Infinite has a really strong beginning. Chief going one-on-one -on -one with Atriox and actually losing was a shock. I mean, they really brought that out of nowhere. And I honestly was surprised to see Chief get manhandled the way he did. Then you get introduced to the pilot, Echo 216, and you relive all those E3 trailers all over again. One thing I would have changed probably for the beginning was actually give a little bit more context of what was the background or what was going on before Infinity got their ass kicked by the Banished. I mean, the entire event takes four minutes to complete, according to Eshram. So why couldn't you just show us the four minutes? Because I feel like a little bit more context about what Chief was doing beforehand would have been more of a big deal. Once you jump into the story, though, you get fully immersed into the setting. The first level, you really get introduced to the Banished. I really like them as a group. I mean, when you first are introduced to them in Halo Wars 2, they get set up like such badasses. The Banished are brutal, skilled, and just a cool background about them. They were basically too badass for the Covenant to handle, and I really like that as a backstory. The first and second levels of the game are basically helping you understand the mechanics, as well as understand the heroes and the enemies of the game. Once you defeat the first boss, Tremonius, which honestly was the, the most cowardly brute I've ever seen in my entire life, you are set off into this open world. From here on out, that's where the story gets really exciting. Basically, the entire time, you're trying to figure out what stopped the weapon from being deleted, while also trying to unravel the mystery behind where Cortana and Atriox are and what caused their disappearance. Your side goal is generally trying to stop the Banished from accomplishing their mission. And a lot of times, people are kind of confused on that. I mean, Chief thinks the Banished are trying to use the Halo Ring to destroy everything like the Covenant did. But actually, their purpose is a lot darker. Along the way, you find out there's a new alien race known as the Zalanin, who are also known as the Endless, who are locked up in the dungeons of Zeta Halo. And basically, the Banished, working alongside a female Zaladin known as the Harbinger, are trying to unlock the dungeon to allow all the Endless to be free, and the Banished are trying to use them in their own purposes. So as the Chief, you're really trying to basically liberate the ring, and also trying to find out where the Endless are to try to stop them from being released. At the same time as all this, Eshram trains his Spartan killers to basically go after Chief the entire game, and they are our mini-bosses. When I look at the story, I'm honestly 
kind of glad to see that 343 is actually taking the time and effort to build a narrative and having you as the player progress through the story, unraveling this mystery. And you look at previous games, they never actually did that the right way. Halo 4 had some moments of that, but Halo 5 was devoid of a straightforward narrative. Each mission has you basically find out a piece of the puzzle, basically understanding what were the events leading up to this, and how did all hell break loose? The cool thing about this game is that they actually have these audio logs that provide context to the story, basically the moments from the first cutscene of the game to where Chief is found in space. So that six month span of time, these audio logs are kind of showing you what's going on here. And I kind of really like that idea. It gives you a reason to go explore and understand the deeper lore that is in this backstory. I mean, honestly, I really like the idea that these audio logs actually give you varying perspectives about the same incidents that are going on. And it's important to understand the different factions and what are their motives. The best moments of this game are definitely the emotional ones. There are times where you can sense Chief's pain and his grieving over Cortana and the situation that they're currently in. Most of the game, Chief is actually blaming himself for the current events. And you, every time you see a cutscene that focuses on his narrative, you can really sense the, the pain and the, and the anger that Chief feels, especially in those moments where you see the lost Spartans. I believe that this story is meant for returning Halo players because there are countless times where there are quotes or callbacks to previous moments in Halo games. If you never played Halo before, you probably would never pick up on some of these little quirks. The writers really know how to tug at your heartstrings and make you feel that nostalgia. 3 for 3 does a great job with the conclusion of this game. Giving some tension between Chief and the weapon, I feel like is really needed here. It felt natural and it was interesting. When the pilot is captured and basically it's up to Chief and the weapon to basically go find him and bring him back home, those are probably the best parts of the game. That path you take literally was an outright battle. And honestly, it felt so satisfying when you finally got the face off against the final bosses. Jacob Rodani fight was kind of easy, but I really liked the aesthetic of it. And the fact that you're fighting in this dark little crevice and he's invisible and he's got these dual swords. I mean, it was so badass. The Ashram fight was really cool too. I mean, Ashram was set out on the right way here. He basically gave a chief a run for his money and basically not only earned Chief's respect, but he or he also earned my respect too. The Harbinger plot was also very interesting too. The fact that she's a Zalanin and she's trying to release the rest of her people kind of put you in a really tough spot. I mean, you understand that the Endless are this ultimate bad guy force, but you can also understand that she's trying to save her people from being captive. So it's kind of like a really tough situation here, but you also kind of feel like you just, you just dodged the bullet in the end basically by stopping her from really opening up the cage. The Cortana scene was kind of cool, but a part of me felt like this was kind of a weird face change for her. I mean, 3 for 3 did a great job of making Cortana basically this top-notch dictator, and she was pissing off everyone. She was pissing off Aatrox after destroying his homeworld. She was pissing off Chief for destroying the Spartan training facility. She was even pissing off the entire Earth by attacking them. Cortana was giving more screen time of being a bad guy here than she did in Halo 5. I kind of felt like she needed a little bit more time to kind of make amends for what she did. By the end of the game, she kind of just turned and said, all right, well, I'm going to make amends with you now, Chief. I know she kind of sacrificed herself for Master Chief, but like this kind of felt a little rushed. The game does end with a mystery, though, because throughout the game, there's always like this mysterious force on the ring that is helping you and you really have no idea what it is. The rumors are that this is offensive bias or possibly Cortana, but we really won't know until the future DLCs. The only show I have with the story is that if you didn't play on the legendary ending, you're only going to get a certain cutscene, which kind of doesn't do justice to what the story is trying to do. Basically, on the legendary ending, you actually find out that Atriox isn't dead and that he basically has the key to unlock the doors that allow the endless to show up again but if you play on the heroic ending you just kind of see everyone like yeah this is great let's go stop everyone on the ring the legendary ending gets you hyped you're like crap i thought we won but the banished were actually successful in their mission and what the hell is going to happen next all in all i really did like the story but i feel like you definitely need to play on legendary to get the full extent of it so let's talk about the characters here. Steve Downs as the Master Chief obviously is going to be great. He's been doing this character for so long, I feel like it'd be weird to see him be voiced by somebody else. Honestly, when you look at Chief in this game though, he does remind you of classic versions of himself. I mean, because there are times where he'll drop those Master Chief lines like, 
you know, I need a weapon. And you all of a sudden, you just kind of like grin and smile and say, ah, you know, that's such a slick line. That's a chief line right there. But what's also interesting is Chief also has this different side of him. In this game, he feels a lot more emotional than he has in previous games. I know in Halo 4 and Halo 5, they really tried to have Master Chief talk a lot more, which for some people was weird. I, I was okay with it. But in this game, he has the right amount of commentary, but his actions and his voice make him sound more emotional based on certain events that are around him. The weapon is also a very interesting character. She technically is supposed to be a carbon copy of Cortana, but she does have some different quirks about her that make her slightly different than what we all know is the Cortana character. Generally, Cortana is this very efficient, very stern, smart, kind of knows everything about what's going on, and the weapon is like more innocent. She jokes around a lot more. She seems like a younger version of Cortana, but doesn't always have the right answer, which I kind of like the fact that 3 for 3 made these slight adjustments that really make the weapon seem different. Echo 216, also known as the pilot, also known as Fernando Esparza, was also a very interesting character. Anyone that says that this trio reminds them of Chief Cortana and Johnson are a little nuts. I mean, Johnson and Echo 216 really aren't that similar. Johnson was overconfident. He was, I'm going to be in your face. I can do whatever I want. As far as it kind of seems like the more realistic version of an average dude during that time period. I feel like when you compare Esparza to a lot of other characters in Halo, he kind of seems very unique. I feel like he kind of represents us and the fear that we would have if we were in this conflict. What's interesting about his character arc is that he's just a volunteer engineer that tried to help the Infinity. And when he thinks that Chief is dead, he literally runs for the hills. Some side note about his character, when they show that film of his wife and his child basically having that phone call to him, at some point in the game, there's a cutscene that talks about it, that basically his family was killed and this is a memento of them. Basically, the weapon and chief basically accept him as being a part of their mini family. And I find that to be so interesting and so heartwarming that it kind of adds to his character development and why you really need to go rescue him during that last por portion of the game. The villains in this game are top notch and really steal the spotlight here. Ashram possibly has the best character development in this game. Firstly, you get his background. He's basically the mentor of Atriox, teaching him everything he knew. You understand his motive for being there because basically he's trying to avenge Atriox and his homeworld by carrying out his will and his motivation to be chief because he wants to be a legend for his people to carry on his message going forward. I mean, bravo, 3 for 3. You finally learned how to develop characters and make them interesting. Where the hell was that in Halo 5? I really like the idea of the Spartan Killers because they kind of gives you a separate entity of people that make you really interested to know about who they are and what they represent. Each of these different Spartan killers have their own backgrounds and are slightly different in their own ways. I feel like my two favorites are going to be Jaga Rodani and Choclock. I know that they're both elites and I probably have a soft side for elites, but I feel like they're very interesting. Jaga being the right hand of Eshram and also the former leader of the Banished Assassins is a really cool idea. And I like the fact that he's like this really close friend of Eshram because Throughout the game, you can kind of notice these little things where he's basically concerned about Eshram's health and saying, hey, chill out, dude. Don't worry. I got this. And it kind of adds to their character development because you wonder like, hey, what? I wonder what these two have been through together. I wonder what battles they've had and basically shows you that these characters are not just some evil dudes. They actually have their own relationships, their own friendships with other characters in this game. Choclock comes off as this really respectful elite, but the fact is, he actually has his really dark past. He's like the head of the interrogation unit of the Banished, and he's like the master of gaining intel. The biggest downside I have about Spartan Killers is that you don't really get to see enough of them. Each one of them is so interesting, but you don't really get a lot of background information unless you read the codex. 3 for 3 should have taken a page out of the Far Cry playbook and basically given each Spartan killer a different region to control so that as you progress through the game, basically you learn about these characters and who they are and what they represent. Even without having this, I still really like the group and I'm hoping we see more Spartan killers in future DLC installments. This game had literally created the best use of boss fights I've ever seen in a Halo game before. And it's proven to me that they definitely need to implement more of these, not only in future installments, but for every future Halo game from here on out. Because honestly, 
This was a such a cool way to have these mini bosses being fought. It built on the Warzone mentality that Halo 5 had and just made it so much better. The only thing I would say that they need to fix when co-op does release is you need to make them a little harder. I feel like if you have co-op against some of these bosses, they will not stand a chance. Next, let's talk about the map and the environment. I feel like this map is a carbon copy of the Halo mission from Combat Evolved, which is really cool. This map looks so stunning in Xbox Series X and Xbox Series S, as well as the PC. And I haven't played it on the old consoles, but from every image and video, they seem pretty good too. I mean, the map isn't massive, but with the recent rumors about the amount of map that was cut off because of the deadline issues, it kind of makes sense. There were so many side missions in the game that it never actually felt like this was a small map to begin with, and I never felt like I was being bored by doing the same types of activities over and over again. I mean, there are some times when you look at the FOB bases where, yeah, you know what, by the last one, you're going to feel like you're doing the same thing. There's a different group of banished that you had to fight for each one, and it kind of made it interesting because you had to have a different strategy going forward. I mean, people that try to compare this map to Witcher 3, Breath of the Wild, Far Cry, Assassin's Creed, you're kind of a little nuts because the reality is this is the first time Halo has implemented an open world layout and they found a way to make it work. Be glad this isn't Fallout 76. However, I do understand and agree with the criticisms that the amount of variation of the terrains is not really present in this game. The only terrain we see is the Southwest Pacific and most of the time, Halo's always had a snowy area and a desert-like area and maybe some swampish areas, but I'm expecting that to be released in the future DLCs. The most fun side missions to play in this game are definitely the Strongholds. The fact that they are like multi-tiered, step-by-step process to complete in this game are so cool. And honestly, I had the most fun when I was able to go save a bunch of Marines and we were basically strolling in there with like 8 to 10 Marines, clearing corners, fighting a bunch of banished. These firefights were just out of control and I honestly had so much fun doing it. Last but not least, I want to talk about the music. Now, what people don't really understand is that music has such a profound effect on both movies and video games. They can have such an impact in bringing the emotion out out in many different ways. The Halo series has always been known for its use of music. The Halo theme itself is synonymous with this game and everybody recognizes it right away. For 343, most of their games have not really utilized music in the correct way and honestly, it's kind of disappointing the way that they've done it from Halo 4 and Halo 5. Like for Halo 4, there were some moments that did have great music where the songs made you feel the emotion of the moment. For instance, when you played the story and you saw the didact for the first time, the soundtrack in the background really brings out the tension of the situation. And the moment where Chief says goodbye to Cortana, the sounds in the background really make you feel that moment. But then you look at Halo 5, they were devoid of a soundtrack. I mean, there are some songs on the album that are decent, but it felt like the game forgot to actually implement the music in the background. There were times where I was having a conversation with Buck and literally there's zero music. Is this silence? Are we playing a silent movie? The fear I had with Halo Infinite was quickly resolved. Halo Infinite actually has a very good soundtrack and honestly I feel at ease knowing that they actually learned how to implement music in it. There were a lot of times where they are implementing sounds in the background that really bring out the emotion. The really cool thing about Halo Infinite's soundtrack is not only do they create alternative versions of songs from the past, but they also create brand new ones and I really like them. What's best about this soundtrack is that it utilizes the songs perfectly well with what's going on in the situation. In the moments that you are meant to see the emotion, you can clearly hear the music in the background and it really sets the tone. There are times when you're fighting against all odds and the song in the background really heightens the situation and you get hyped because you're about to fight against a whole bunch of people. Now, I'm not saying this soundtrack is at the same level as Halo 2, Halo 3, or Halo ODST, but this definitely shows you how 3 for 3 has definitely improved on its previous blunders and learn from its mistakes. Creating my final verdict, I did find that there are a lot of positives in this game, but there are also definitely some things that need to be fixed. The strengths of this game definitely come from the great gameplay. The Golden Triangle has never felt so good, or at least it hasn't felt so good since Halo 3. This game is so reminiscent of classic Halo, but it has a modern twist to it, so it doesn't feel like I'm playing a game that's 10 years old. All maps are really fun to play, 
But the biggest issue is that there's only 10 of them. I feel like they definitely need to add more maps because with only 10 maps, they can become stale pretty quickly. Such a small amount of game modes at launch is definitely a surprise, but this can easily be fixed with future updates. Guns are definitely a bright spot in this game. The battle rifle feels so good to use and the Halo Infinite Soul Rifle is probably my favorite version of the gun in the entire series. Equipment are definitely a well-deserved return back to Halo. I was definitely nervous about the grapple shot use in Halo Infinite, but I quickly realized that it's easily my favorite equipment and I will constantly go find it. Vehicle health and spawns have to be adjusted in this game because the fact is the health of a vehicle can't be so low that I will die less than a minute while riding in a banshee. The biggest issue I have with the multiplayer is going to be the progression system. I need to have more armors to unlock without a paywall to stop me. I feel like Halo Infinite is limiting the amount of customization that normally people have in Halo, and I want to be able to pick anything I want on my Spartan, whether it's armor pieces or the colors that we wear, because honestly, it's kind of a buzzkill not being able to be as creative as possible. When looking at the campaign, I feel like this is where the game really shines. The story does a great job at answering several questions, but also posing new ones that allow us to really think about hey what's going to happen next chief and his crew have great character development and the banished the spartan killers and eshram have their time in the spotlight and honestly i wish i got to see more of them cortana's arc did feel a little rushed but it's the kind of the best thing you can do with how broken her arc was in Halo 5. Boss battles in this game are literally the best in the entire series, and I can't wait to see new types of boss battles that they're going to include in the future DLC installments. The transition to an open world concept was definitely bold, but it was the right step going forward. This gave us a new sense of exploration, and I feel like it was kind of lacking that in previous games. I mean, we all know the mission Halo from Comet Evolved had sense of exploration, but not this much. And I feel like we kind of need a little bit more when we get to the next DLC installment. The music of this game really got me excited. The fact that it can bring out the emotion, whether it's sadness or the intensity that you need to feel throughout Halo games really gets me happy. I think this is a return to form of what Halo music is supposed to be. The question I posed in the beginning of this review was, does Halo Infinite recapture the magic that was set during the Bungie era? The answer is yes. Halo Infinite proves that with the right gameplay mechanics and narrative driven by its good music and storytelling, Halo can return to its roots and become a contender yet again. It has some tweaking to do for sure. From where I'm sitting, this game has lived up to the hype. Only makes me want to play it more and more. Overall, I'm giving this game a 9.3 out of 10. It may not be the best game in the series, but it's definitely 3 for 3's best and deserves to be in conversation for game of the year. Well, everyone, that's my review of Halo Infinite. If you have your own review score, please type it in the comments below. And if you like this video, please drop a like, subscribe for more future content. Till next time, this is Marsman Gaming signing off. Peace.